Um, okay, I'll re I will repeat that. My name is Jane Gavronsky. I am with Finos, and Luca, my partner here, will will tell you more about what Finos is and about what we're doing at Finos with artificial intelligence efforts. So, hi everyone. Um, so let me let me give you a brief uh, overview of what AI strategic initiative is within Finos. Finos is uh, an open source foundation focused on fintech, part of Linux Foundation. There are more than 80 uh, members, uh, mainly banks and service providers, cloud providers, data vendors. Um, every year, there are some uh, strategic initiatives that are put forward by the board. And AI uh, was one of the 2024 strategic initiative. And AI strategic initiative is uh, made of three different working groups. There is AI readiness, where we help financial service uh, embracing AI. Uh, Finos is very well known for the open source readiness helping financial services to embrace open source. And building on top of that, we are also helping financial services to embrace AI, which uh, basically means building a governance framework for onboarding AI uh, within their daily operations. Next to the AI readiness, we have also the Finos LLM exploration. As you guys know, AI is not a new thing. Uh, the new thing here is the LLM. So the large language model brings new capabilities, efficiencies, and the question is how to really use LLM to bring uh, operational efficiency into financial services, and specifically how to build and how to use open source, truly open source LLM in, in financial services. So for this, we have a specific uh, work stream, which is Finos LLM exploration, where we are building together with a community of university researchers uh, of truly open source LLMs and tooling around it. And next to the Finos LLM uh, exploration group, we also have a Finos research fund, where we are raising funds across members, not only, in order to um, fund the activities that are needed for building the Finos LLM uh, in the future. The, um, maybe, um, Jane, do you want to talk about more about how, how Finos and um, the AI initiative is, is bringing value to the members? So let me cover a little bit of, um, and I don't know how many of you guys here are um, involved in, in financial services industry and um, whether it, you know something about how technology efforts develop within financial services. So I'll just cover that just to, to set the baseline. So um, within financial services, and, and in this case we mean both uh, large institutions like banks, which have you know commercial banking, um, effort uh, uh, components, and they they also have investment banking components, meaning uh, where they they take companies public, where they trade with, uh, they provide trading um, abilities for institutions, as well as um, companies that provide various financial services, such as clearing, for example, clearing of transactions and custody of transactions. This includes also exchanges, you know, where where securities are traded or um, activities in, in non-exchange traded uh, instruments, which are more sort of bespoke. It also, the, the Finos includes, if you looked at the list, uh, and I'll put, put that list back up, it also includes fintechs, so new startups or uh, that are either focused on providing financial services or focus on providing technology for financial services, as well as many um, software providers who have a focus or who have a line into financial services. So this is a fairly comp uh, you know, complete ecosystem of both technology and financial, uh, financially focused com uh, companies that offer financial services. Um, and 
you know, um, within Wall Street, Wall Street has always been very um, tech focused. Uh, they were probably one of the earlier ones who started in the mainframe world and have embraced every single technology trend since then, including AI. Um, and that is part of the challenge usually within financial services is that your, your stack includes every generation of every software known to man. Uh, in, now, they're also extremely, um, it used to be called information intensive, right? Because before you had digitized as access to things, people actually called each other and got information from each other. Uh, now, what used to be called information focus is now called data focus. And when Luke and I were talking about this, uh, you know, he, he made that point very succinctly. The amount of data within financial services is is cra is is like a lot. It's really crazy the amount of data and the different type t different types of data. It's data about customers, data about what's going on in the market, data about different companies, data. It could be data about I don't know the environment. It could be data, um, you know, about uh, what the economists are saying and what you know what's going on in various d in in different industries because financial services cover all kinds of industries from a financing perspective, right? So so. Um, and very importantly, is also knowing information about your customers. So all of this data needs to be processed, and a lot of the challenges that technologists normally inside financial institutions work on is on how to prepare this data to be usable. And um, well, it, it also had it was was a big part of my job. So, so these are these are the challenges. It's it's always the intersection of having the best and the fastest um, access to um, uh, latest software, latest APIs, latest compute power, big, biggest compute power, but also making sure that your data is well is well prepared to be used. So um, and if you think about where what what this means from an evolutionary perspective, it begins to make sense uh, why um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, as well as um, large language models would be extremely interesting and attractive within the financial services space. Now, park that thought, and if you're asking yourself why would financial uh, services companies that are f focused on financial services why would they want to kind of create their own cohort why don't they just participate in open source in general uh, what what I'll tell you is that like any other industrial cohort a lot of the case a lot of the use cases that uh, these companies work on are very very similar so when they sort of get together with each other they can understand and, and recognize and connect to each other's use cases very well the other thing is that a lot of the work that is getting done in processing this data and pre preparing the data or collecting data or doing you know, creating components that get used in building either trading systems or account processing systems, those components are not really competitive in, 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 in and of themselves. That is not where the IP is. And so because there is just so much work that always needs to get done, companies increasingly are recognizing that in sharing information and sharing components and mutualizing some of this work, they will achieve two things which are really hard. One is they will get access to more talent and more, um, uh, you know, just more people than they can afford to pay for, right? Because open source contributions will be reusable. And two, um, they, they will... Um, they will not have to reinvent this wheel, right? So that they'll be able to reuse both the code and the talent, but they will also have access to the most interesting solutions, right? The, be the best solutions there are because of their open source collaboration. So that's why we're seeing uh, companies come and join this club. And, and as one of our members actually just told us on Friday, she said, you know, projects are great, solution software is great that you guys have that, but just being able to talk to other people and find out what they do and how they're doing it is even more valuable. So what we're seeing at Finos is people are coming and they are really enjoying the space of being able to talk to each other in a non-competitive, non-threatening way. Um, 
and share ideas and implementation experiences. So, and, and as Luca mentioned, we, um, when Fino started, we have an initiative since the beginning called Open Source Readiness because the other thing lots of people know about financial services is they're highly regulated. And what that means is they, they have lots of rules and procedures about what they can and cannot do. And so when someone comes to, when an engineer from within a company comes and says, oh, I want to go and, and I want to contribute my code or I want to use somebody else's code and add to it, uh, most of the time compliance and legal departments say, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. So then comes the whole long co protracted conversation around, okay, well, well, under which conditions can I do it? Can I prove that I'm not leaking any IP? Can I prove that I'm not giving away any industry secrets that, or any of your proprietary secrets? Can I prove that the code that I'm taking is, is safe and compliant with your processes and procedures? And that's where open source readiness comes in. It's, it's to help create the conversation between the legal and compliance people internally at all of these institutions and the engineers to enable the path back and forth and to say, okay, yes, you can participate in open source in a compliant uh, and safe way without giving away your secrets and you're not going to also inject code which is, um, you know, buggy or dangerous for us, right? So that's what we did with open source readiness. And now what we're seeing is obviously this, in, as I'm describing this, you're probably recognizing that the same thing is happening in NAI. Uh, there are lots of questions around, well, how, what is a safe and, and um, uh, um, ethical way of using AI? Do I have the licenses? Can I use the data? How do I know that what I'm doing is in the long run okay? And that's where we're hearing from our members where they're saying, look, what you guys did for open source readiness we think is very valuable in AI readiness as well. The other thing I think you should touch on, and um, I'll stop talking and give Luca a chance, uh, is um, what this means from a, regulator, from a regulator perspective. Yeah, so the, the, there are different use cases um, where you can apply AI in financial services. And probably the, the most interesting one is uh, regulatory interpretation. As you might know, financial service industry has uh, lots of different uh, regulation they have to comply with, which basically means send data to the supervisor and get basically a check on the data that they sent. And it's really you know, the same process for all banks broadly, and it's done um, periodically. So it's perfect use case for, for automation. And it's perfect also for the uh, LLM exploration with Infinos because it falls in the uh, public synthetic data set pre-competitive use case. So as Jane mentioned, Finos is the venue, is a hub for cooperation within financial services. So we are, we are not touching the uh, competitive use cases because we want to leave that uh, out of scope given that they are sensible uh, use cases for the members, but we can definitely add lots of value when it comes to pre-competitive use cases. And reg interpretation uh, is, is super interesting. We have recently run a hackathon uh, where we tested some of those um, LLMs, and uh, Joseph, that is also here, he was also at the hackathon. And I want to go a bit deeper on these use cases for showing you um, how the use case fits within the broader picture of the Finos LLM exploration that we are running uh, at Finos. So think about that the outcome should be an open, a truly open source LLM. So how do we get there? And this is the blueprint that we design in order to move from a use case, which in this case is a regulatory interpretation, to uh, open financial LLM that is fine-tuned, trained and fine-tuned for, for interpreting regulation. So the different steps and activities that we are running is first, obviously, identifying the use case, and this is something that we have done uh, through workshops. Uh, once we have found the use case, we, we are building a benchmark suite for benchmarking the different models against uh, a, a benchmark that basically says, which model is really, uh, really able to understand regulation in plain English 
and interpret regulation and turn regulation into a reporting uh, rule, right? So that's, that's not trivial. There are different models that do different things very well. There are some models that are good in reasoning. Some other mo models are good in, in uh, uh, translation. There are some that are good in regulatory interpretation. Uh, if there is not, then you have to build one. Um, after the benchmark suite, you have to find a way to contribute the data. So we are building a data contribution framework where uh, banks and financial services companies can contribute data safely into an uh, open financial data set. And honestly, this was easy for the regulatory interpretation because most of the data is public. Data is basically the, the regulation text, right? So it's, it's kind of easy. And looking at the challenges that we will find ahead is how to enable banks to contribute um, more sensible data to, to the open data set we are creating. And last uh, but not least, obviously, is the open financial LLM. So a truly open source LLM that matches the, um, the open uh, model framework, sorry, the model openness framework, where bas basically all the components of the model must be open. Um, and this was a, a use case I wanted to bring today because at the hackathon, for example, we, there was a team that built a prototype for that, and the team used uh, Yama3. And as you guys might know, uh, Yama3 is not open from uh, the model openness framework point of view. So for example, from this hackathon, we understood where are the uh, bottlenecks and the challenges in building uh, an LLM that can really understand regulatory uh, requirements and being open at the same time. Um, are there any questions, by the way? Um, any, uh, any questions, any doubts? So how can you contribute to the uh, Finos uh, AI strategic initiative? There are different ways. Um, if, if, you are, if you're working for a financial service uh, institution, you can obviously become a member and you can uh, guide the roadmap of, of this initiative. If you are part of a university of um, uh, a research uh, institution, you can contribute with code and you can always be part of the uh, weekly uh, calls that we run, uh, we run every week. Um, and you can also become a recipient of those funds that we are raising. So you can become a recipient and you can help us to build the, the different activities that we showed you before. So you can help us build the benchmark, you can help us build the data contribution framework and the LLM uh, in the future. Um, so Jane, what, what do you think um, are the challenges um, what, that we are facing ahead? What, what are the things are the bottlenecks in your opinion? So I, I will say that there are still some cultural things. Financial services or uh, companies are not necessarily the best. They, they don't. It's not completely in the DNA yet to collaborate. And um, you know, I sort of my career grew up in financial services technology, and it is not. You know, your first reaction is like, oh, everything is private and proprietary, so no sharing. So definitely, there is um, a little bit of that. Oh yes, you can share, and look how good it feels. And um, next week, uh, we have our conference in London. If any of you are from London, please come along. Uh, we have information on that. But you know, it's it's really refreshing for me to see the uh, how the buzz in the room is, how excited people are to be together and to recognize that they're they, they work for different companies and they can learn from each other so there is definitely that and it applies to every every sort of technical layer you can think of um, and I think that 
it's particularly a little bit still dangerous because, you know, the reaction is always, oh, new tech, I'm going to develop it for my bank and it's going to make loads of money and it's going to be super secret and I'm not going to share with anybody. But the problem with that, of course, is that you're in your own silo and you don't learn from anyone or you're not even leveraging the best tools there are because you're just kind of in a room by yourself. So, but once, let's say you get past that, I think one of the, the next challenges is uh, data and whether that data is private or public. So again, it's kind of the same thing. And I think um, if I think of use cases, one way to classify the types of use cases there are is to say, OK, am I going to use the new tools to leverage, to, to make my work internally or my my people's work internally more productive? Or am I going to use the tools to kind of innovate and create new features and services that don't exist today? So that's, you know, there's like hundreds of ways to stratify use cases, but if we just looked at those, those two ways, one is if you think about, you know, again, think about the legacy stack that's grown up in the organizations over time, Usually, when a new person joins, it takes about a year to figure out what the application landscape is, what the data flow landscape is, and to become productive. That's purely from a tech side. From a uh, business process side, it can be even worse, right? People are used to, you know, plug, punching stuff into systems by hand, or th this, depart this person in this department knows how, how to do the next step and the other person doesn't. Information flow is really, really bad. So if you just applied to those two use cases and just harnessed the information that exists inside the institution, before you even get to co-piloting, right? Co-piloting as in writing, code together, you could leverage this a lot to, to A, d uh, make people more, help people be more productive, meaning it's not, we're not talking about job elimination here, we're talking about just actually a more positive experience of being an employee and feeling accomplished, and B, you can help your customers uh, get a better and faster answer. So I think that there will be, and I know that there are already, Lots of efforts within, especially large institutions, to leverage uh, both, um, you know, uh, machine learning and large language models to be able to answer questions purely internally. And then, of course, there is the whole other section of, okay, w what does this mean, and how do things work differently now? And I, well, I, I think that that many financial institutions are, are looking at that really hard. Um, again, I know of several already who have like serious AI research departments within them. And you know, J.P. Morgan I think came out and said we're going to train everybody on on how to uh, how to use large language models when they join. So that means that the, the people are seeing this as a as changing the way people work. The, the, the only way I, the only thing I can compare it to, or at least when I started my career, um, you know, the, the desktop PC first came out and that was still the IBM with the two floppies, right? But everybody had to have one all of a sudden, and then, and then you had the pizza box, right, the, 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 the sun machines. This is, it's, it, but everything was still on the mainframe, right? So, so the question was, okay, when the end users were starting to, so this is, this is kind of at least that big of a shift, if not bigger. Um, so I think that there will be a lot of use cases around this. Now, combing through the data internally is obviously not going to be a shared endeavor. But, I, but the tooling that you use to do that and to, to kind of comb through that data will be arguably the same. So that's, that's one great place for collaboration. Um, now, in terms of being able to, and you were talking about benchmarking before, right? So uh, to, to be able to fine tune the models or to to create benchmarks that tell you which models are doing better than others in terms of fi uh, uh, fi even answering uh, questions on regulations. 
that's going to be, I think, extremely important because that's one of the one of the uh, big challenges right now. Is um, large, uh, if you have to comply with regulations, undoubtedly you have many lawyers on your staff who are interpreting what the regulation means, writing policy internally, and then someone else is translating that into code, and someone else is translating that into reports. That's a lot of people and a lot of cost and a lot of time. Why should that be? If you imagine a world where either a lawyer writes something and, and you can get rules right out of the back of that, or even better, if regulators start, started writing rules such that they're more processable by machine as opposed to needing you know, several lawyers. And, and that is, I think, something definitely... Um, Regulators are, have innovation departments and they're looking at this as well and they've told us that they are and we're hoping that what we're doing here is creating a bridge and a collaboration across, across those two groups where, um, you know, again, it's this kind of the same lack of resource who are SMEs in the space. So the more we work together on this, the, the, the better and faster we're going to get there. Um, so I spent my career mainly in the in the startup scene and mainly as an entrepreneur and I was always frustrated with the fact that if you want to push forward a standard or uh, if you want uh, banks in this case to collaborate, it's almost impossible. You really have to have uh, a structure like Finos where they're bringing all these, all these banks and financial service providers and data vendors together sitting at the same table and try to find a solution and common standards for, for, for the problem, which everybody has right now. It's basically adopting AI and in a safe and, and controlled way. And when, when I joined Finos just a few weeks ago, but it was really uh, fascinating to see how quickly you can move forward with, with projects, right? Having the right people that are at the table together and, uh, and discussing about problems and finding solutions in the open. So that was really, really, really nice for me. So I, I really, I really like this this approach. Uh, maybe a few words about about the benchmark. Uh, what's the time check? So the the benchmark is is interesting because we've been working with uh, Columbia University in New York, and they are building a standard f uh, benchmark. Sorry for um, for evaluating different models. And the way they're doing it, they are uh, they they're writing down questions about, uh, in this case, uh, SEC filings. So, uh, you know, all public companies in the U.S. but also in Europe have to file their uh, balance sheet, for example. And they have uh, lots of different questions with the right answers. And then they are testing the different models and try to see which model is the is the most accurate uh, when it comes to uh, interpreting uh, uh, financial uh, statements of public companies, and building on that, we are using a similar approach for the for the reg interpretation use case, which is basically getting in this case of the hackathon was to get the EMIR, which is a very specific regulation for derivatives uh, in Europe, trying to find the right Q and As, uh, and then test the model on the different question and answers and see what's the performance of, of, of the different models. And it, it, when there is no model, then basically to build or fine tune a new one that can match uh, or can reach a certain standard. So that was really uh, interesting. And talking to the different stakeholders, apparently this is something that is not available right now in the industry. So it's also, also very useful for, for the industry itself. If you guys are interested, I would encourage you to either um, reach out to look one, look up the Finos website, <laughs> finos.org. Two, come to the conference if you're in London uh, next week on Wednesday. Three, uh, reach out to either myself or Luca and and tell us what you're interested in uh, working on. Um, and we, yeah, we, or possibly you already work for our, our member firm, so, you know, we can put you in touch with, with 
more people, you know, more colleagues within your firm who are working with us as well. So uh, it's it's really exciting, and I'm happy to answer any questions or anything we didn't cover, if you guys want. Um, there's there's a lot of opportunity here, and I think what's what's different is um, there are many technologies that are applicable, but what our cohort brings to the table are real practical use cases and just examples of where what they need to do, how it's working, where it's not working, and and then together we spend time thinking about what's the art of the possible of how could it work differently. So I think that's that was very I think uh, eye opening with especially with the students at Columbia, which is they they have a lot of you know power, they have a lot of ideas, but they don't really know how it works in the industry. What this what the Finos group brings is we can give you lots of examples of things that could work better and differently in the industry. Um, so if if you're interested in that, come and work with us. Any any questions? Happy to answer. Good question. So we, so the, the research budget will not be used for compute, right? So we will rely on, on members' compute for that. And the training budget is really for running the activities that we showed you before. So starting from the use case identification, then building the benchmark, building the data framework, contribution framework, the data set. So that's basically the budget where, where the budget will be allocated. And it will be mainly for academic researchers that want to work on those activities and contribute the result back to Finos. Um, when it comes to a model of validation, you talked about benchmarks that you're sole uh, validation, or do you plan on having uh, a, a distributed form of validation across all your the, the members? For the, the, um, to assess model the model quality, especially when you talk about regulatory comp compliance, I'm assuming the goal is to have nigh close to 100% uh, accuracy on the model. How's the validation process of this model uh, going to be carried out? In broad strokes, is it a? I can, I can answer ge generally. Um, so, like I said, if you think about, so the regulations are well known. It's public text, right? Every regulation has to be public text. What happens afterwards is, pretty much every company, they either there are um, service providers who are usually a a whole host of expert lawyers who interpret the, the regulation and break it down into rules. The rules are then, or that happens internally at a large bank, right? Like a JP Morgan or a Citibank will have their own lawyers. Then those rules are taken and written as policy within the bank. So each bank is supposed to have a policy. Those policies are then turned into business requirements. The business requirements are turned into code, and then you get the reports. That's what normally happens. So if you were wanted to validate a model and how a model does, all you have to do is take an existing regulation, take the interpretations and the various kind of forms of policies that different banks have written and see how the model does against it. Can you produce the same or near the same output if you were to run it through a benchmark data set? So in many cases, the, the stuff, it, it already exists. Now, there, there could be differences in interpretation and that's why different banks have different policies and you know different permutations and combinations of legal entities and product types, et cetera, et cetera. But generally speaking, that's what you, we would be leaning on, those lawyers having written those policies. Question. So the, to, to give you a more, even more practical example, on one side there is the English law, right? So the plain English law. And on the other side there is the already written reporting rules. Imagine like a very 
Python kind of uh, piece of code. And we can use that as a, as a training or fine tuning set for the model so that when a new regulation comes up, the model should be able to write the new Python uh, rule, reporting rules by himself. And then we can benchmark this against the existing one and try to, and try to give evaluation of, of, of the capabilities of interpreting the rules. Like you mean the middle methodology type of? Uh, uh, are you referring to that? It could be. It's still an exploration. So honestly, I don't. I don't. I cannot answer that question right now. But uh, you can. I'm pretty sure yes. I'm. Pr I'm pretty sure that the answer is yes, and I think it will be yes for a while. And it's very simple. It's because these are regulated institutions right now. No, they will always be regulated. But right now, in order to prove that you are compliant with the regulation, it's a very stringent process, which is then audited, which is then you know reviewed by regulators. And um, as far as I know, and I don't work at a bank anymore, but as far as I know, most of these compliance attestations still require a human in the middle that says, yes, I've checked these rules and I agree with these rules. Perhaps soon that will cease to need to be, but today that is the requirement. So you again, if you look at um, anything that, and the banks are very, very hesitant to put anything out in public about how they're using AI or LLM, but when they do, there's always something that says there, you know, it's tested by, by humans in the end or it's validated by humans. You can get the machine to go faster, and eventually you, you trust, and it can all go faster. But I, I, I'm quite sure that that is still the case today. Thank you. So you mention uh, regulation uh, as a use case a lot. But can you expand more on other use cases that are important to your member, whether it's natural language processing or not? So yeah, the, um, we are running a workshop next week for identifying the use cases that are relevant for the members in London uh, on Tuesday. So I will I will answer to that question more precisely next week, uh, if if you will. But um, it's it's uh, it's basically all pre-competitive use cases like uh, how to interpret regulation, how to make sure that, for example, if you are if you are a bank that is uh, investing in uh, mortgages and you want to include in your risk management system data sources that can inf can give you ideas of how those mortgages can perform in the future like climate related risk for example all banks have that problem so how can ai or generative ai help you bank to include more data sources in your scenario or risk management uh, uh, system. So this is something that came up uh, in a previous uh, uh, community call. So this is something that we are looking uh, at. And there are different open source projects for that that are relevant for, for this. For example, there is a project called OS Climate, which has exactly that kind of setting. They are bringing together different data sources and they are standardizing it. But then how do you integrate the data uh, standard of you know uh, OS climate, for example, with your own data standard that you are using at the bank, and maybe that's that's a use case that we are going to pursue. But again, next week we have this use case identification workshop, so very very good timing for the questions. Thank you. Um, first off, thank you for the time uh, you took to talk about Finos, it's really interesting. You lightly touched upon the fact that when working with the Columbia students, they don't exactly have full extensive knowledge on how the industry might work. And as we know, finance is one of the most regulated industries in the globe. 
of course. So I was wondering, how do you exactly bridge the gap between innovation and what can be done and the new approaches? and also the regulations that are already established in terms of, you know, you mentioned that Columbia students had a lot of new ideas and power and, you know, let's try to change the world. But of course, in big institutions that cannot be mass adopted. So I was wondering, what's your approach towards that? Okay. We, we have to step down because the next uh, of course. <laughs> answer as the next speakers are preparing. I mean, the best way to do it is to bring the collaborations together. Really, it's it's the hackathons that Luca mentioned because it's from that practical experience that, you know, hopefully the students will blow somebody's mind and uh, somebody will teach the students something about how it works that they can incorporate. So I think the best way, honestly, is through collaboration workshops, hackathons, and just kind of getting engaged with each other. Thank you guys, thank you for your time.